We go into the claim business and fail at the bottom. When we finally left for Esmeralda, horseback, we had an addition to the company in the person of Captain John Nye, the governor's brother. He had a good memory and a tongue hung in the middle. This is a combination which gives immortality to conversation. Captain John never suffered the talk to flag or falter once during the 120 miles of the journey. In addition to his conversational powers, he had one or two other endowments of a marked character. One was a singular handiness about doing anything and everything, from laying out a railroad or organizing a political party, down to sewing on buttons, shoeing a horse, or setting a broken leg, or a hen. Another was a spirit of accommodation that prompted him to take the needs, difficulties, and perplexities of anybody and everybody upon his own shoulders at any and all times, and dispose of them with admirable facility and alacrity. Hence, he always managed to find vacant beds and crowded inns, and plenty to eat in the emptiest larders. And finally, wherever he met a man, woman, or child, in camp, inn, or desert, he either knew such parties personally, or had been acquainted with a relative of the same. Such another traveling comrade was never seen before. I cannot forbear giving a specimen of the way in which he overcame difficulties. On the second day out, we arrived very tired and hungry at a poor little inn in the desert and were told that the house was full, no provisions on hand, and neither hay nor barley to spare for the horses. We must move on. The rest of us wanted to hurry on while it was yet light, but Captain John insisted on stopping a while. We dismounted and entered. There was no welcome for us on any face. Captain John began his blandishments, and within twenty minutes he had accomplished the following things. V's found old acquaintances and three teamsters, discovered that he used to go to school with the landlord's mother, recognized his wife as a lady whose life he had saved once in California by stopping her runaway horse, mended a child's broken toy and won the favor of its mother, a guest of the inn, helped the hostler bleed a horse, and prescribed for another horse that had the heaves, treated the uh, entire party three times at the landlord's bar, produced a ladder paper that anybody had seen for a week, and sat himself down to read the news to a deeply interested audience. The result, summed up, was as follows. The hostler found plenty of feed for our horses, we had a trout supper, an exceedingly sociable time after it, good beds to sleep in, and a surprising breakfast in the morning. And when we left, we left lamented by all. Captain John had some bad traits, but he had some uncommonly valuable ones to offset them with. Esmeralda was in many respects another Humboldt, but in a little more forward state. The claims we had been paying assessments on were entirely worthless, and we threw them away. The principal one cropped out of the top of a knoll that was 14 feet high, and the inspired board of directors were running a tunnel under the knoll to strike the ledge. The tunnel would have to be 70 feet long and would then strike the ledge at the same depth that a shaft 12 feet deep would have reached. The board were living on the assessments. And B, this hint comes too late for the enlightenment of New York silver miners. They have already learned all about this neat trick by experience. The board had no desire to strike the ledge, knowing that it was as barren of silver as a curbstone. This reminiscence calls to mind Jim Townsend's tunnel. He had paid assessments on a mine called the Daily till he was well nigh penniless. Finally, an assessment was levied to run a tunnel 250 feet on the Daily, and Townsend went up on the hill to look into, the, into matters. He found the daily cropping out of the apex of an exceedingly sharp pointed peak and a couple of men up there facing the proposed tunnel. Townsend made a calculation and he said to the men, so you have taken a contract to run a tunnel into this hill 250 feet to strike this ledge? Yes, sir. Well, do you know that you have got one of the most expensive and arduous undertakings before you that was ever conceived by man? 
Why, no. How is that? Because this hill is only 20 feet, 5 feet through from side to side. So you have got to build 225 feet of your tunnel on trestle work. The ways of silver mining boards are exceedingly dark and sinuous. We took up various claims and commenced shafts and tunnels on them, but never finished any of them. We had to do a certain amount of work on each to hold it, else other parties could seize our property after the expiration of ten days. We were always hunting up new claims and doing a little work on them, and then waiting for a buyer who never came. We never found any ore that would yield more than $50 a ton, and as the mills charged $50 a ton for working ore and extracting the silver, our pocket money melted steadily away, and none returned to take its place. We lived in a little cabin and cooked for ourselves, and altogether it was a hard life a hopeful one, for we never ceased to expect fortune and a customer to burst upon us some day. At last, when flour reached a dollar a pound, and money could not be borrowed on the best security at less than 8% a month, I being without the security, too, I abandoned mining and went to milling. This is to say, I went to work as a common laborer in a quartz mill at $10 a week and board. Chapter 36, A Quartz Mill, Amalgamation, Screening Tailings, First Quartz Mill in Nevada, Fire Assay, A Smar, Assay, I Stake the, uh, for an Advance. I had already learned how hard and long and dismal a task it is to borrow, burrow down into the bowls of the earth and get out the coveted ore. And now I learned that the burrowing was only half the work, and that to get the silver out of the ore was the dreary and laborious other half of it. We had to turn out at six in the morning and keep at it till dark. This mill was a six stamp affair, driven by steam. Six tall upright rods of iron, as large as a man's ankle, and heavily shod with a mass of iron and steel at their lower ends were framed together like a gate, and these rose and fell one after the other in a ponderous dance in an iron box called a battery. Each of these rods or stamps weighed 600 pounds. One of us stood by the battery all day long, breaking up masses of silver bearing rock with a sledge and shoveling it into the battery. The ceaseless dance of the stamps pulverized the rock to powder, and a stream of water that trickled into the battery turned it to a creamy paste. The minutest particles were driven through a fine wire screen, which fitted close around the battery and were washed into great tubs, warmed by superheated steam, amalgamating pans, they are called. The mass of pulp in the pans was kept constantly stirred up by revolving mullers. A quantity of quicksilver was kept always in the battery, and this seized some of the liberated gold and silver particles and held on to them. Quicksilver was shaken in a fine shower into the pans, also about every half hour, through a buckskin sack. Quantities of coarse salt and sulfate of copper were added from time to time to assist the amalgamation of by destroying base metals which coated the gold and silver and would not let it unite with the quicksilver. All these tiresome things we had to attend to constantly. Streams of dirty water flowed always from the pans and were carried off in broad wooden troughs to the ravine. One would not suppose that atoms of gold and silver would float on top of six inches of water, but they did, and in order to catch them, coarse blankets were laid in the troughs, and little obstructing rifles charged with quicksilver were placed here and there across the troughs also. These riffles had to be cleaned and the blankets washed out every evening to get their precious accumulations. And after all this eternity of trouble, one third of the silver and gold and a ton of rock would find its way to the end of the troughs in the ravine at last and have to be worked over again some day. There is nothing so aggravating as silver mining. There never was any idle time in that mill. There was always something to do. 
It is a pity that Adam could not have gone straight out of Eden into a quartz mill in order to understand the full force of his doom to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. Every now and then during the day we had to scoop some pulp out of the pans and tediously wash it in a horn spoon, wash it little by little over the edge till at last nothing was left but some little dull globules of quicksilver in the bottom. If they were soft and yielding, the pan needed some salt or some sulfate of copper or some other chemical rubbish to assist digestion. If they were crisp to the touch and would retain a dent, they were frightened with all the silver and gold they could seize and hold, and consequently the pans needed a fresh charge of quicksilver. When there was nothing else to do, one could always screen tailings. That is to say, he could shovel up the dried sand that had washed down to the ravine through the troughs and dash it against an upright wire screen to free it from pebbles and prepare